Uh, we're going to now turn to uh, a problem that um, s seems to me, from my perspective anyway, be, get be getting a lot uh, more media attention than it has uh, in the past, wildlife trafficking. It's certainly a huge problem, multi-billion dollar problem, uh, the third highest uh, trafficking in terms of volume after narcotics and weapons. So certainly a, uh, a, a scourge for developing countries. We're going to hear from three experts right now. I'm going to ask Gretchen Peters, Jackson Miller, and Sarah Prey to come forward, please. Can everyone hear me? I feel a little bit like Oprah, and I have to tell you, I love it. I hope you guys are ready to talk about your childhoods in addition to wildlife trafficking. Of course. Um, okay. Good morning. My name is Sarah Prey. I'm the Senior Policy Analyst for Africa at the Open Society Foundations. Um, thank you all for being here, and thanks uh, to GFI for in inviting me to participate in this. I do have to um, correct the record. I'm not an expert on wildlife trafficking. These two are, um, but I am happy to, to shepherd the discussion. Um, just a brief word on um, where Open Society Foundations um, is coming to this issue. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the Open Society Foundations. We're a global grant-making and advocacy organization founded by George Soros. We operate all over the world in about 50 countries, uh, focusing on governance, accountability, and the rule of law. Um, many of you know sort of our traditional uh, entry into this space was around transparency and accountability, uh, particularly around natural resources. We were one of the early funders of the Publish What You Pay movement, and I think uh, the, the natural evolution has now been to increasingly uh, focus on illicit financial flows. And for example, our fiscal governance program, which is a grant-making program, is um, starting to look a lot more at these issues, and some of our regional work. Uh, most notably, our West African Foundation has been uh, partnering with GFI and, and doing some, some great work, so take a look at that. Um, but without further ado, I think we'll turn to our discussion. Um, I think that the hope of this panel today uh, is to look at wildlife trafficking, to be sure, but also to look at it in the broader context of transnational crime and illicit financial flows and how this particular issue um, is part of a much bigger puzzle, what those connections are, and in light of those connections, what are the ways forward and the policy prescriptions therein. So I think uh, you have their bios, but just you know, briefly, Jackson Miller um, is going to kick us off, and then we'll turn over to Gretchen. Okay. Thanks. May I use the podium? You right. go for it. All right, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jackson Miller. I'm the lead analyst for wildlife and environmental crimes at C4ADS. We are a DC-based nonprofit, and we specialize in data-driven research and analysis on illicit networks worldwide. I use the term illicit rather broadly, as our past work has dealt with a wide range of issues, from tracking Russian arms shipments to Syria via Ukraine, along with examining the nexus of natural resource constraints and terrorism in the Sahel. And for the past couple of years, we've been delving into the drivers of transnational wildlife and environmental crime. But first, before I start, I'd like to thank Global Financial Integrity for not only hosting such a great event, but for also dealing with my slew of emails at 2 a.m. last night as I tweak this presentation. <laughs> um, but to kick it off, um, so the global trade in illicit elephant ivory, which is what I want to focus on today, flows through a rather long and complex supply chain, primarily from Sub-Saharan Africa to markets in Southeast, a Southeast and East Asia. And depending on where one is positioned along this supply chain, um, ivory can acquire a variety of use values. For example, in the poaching leg of the supply chain, um, in the heart of the African bush, ivory, for the most part, takes the form of bush currency, right? Simply bartered in exchange for poaching weapons, ammunition, or in some extreme cases, food and other means of subsistence. Moving up the value chain, if you will, along the trafficking leg, ivory has also taken the form of a financial or an investment vehicle. Um, for speculation. In fact, our research has su suggested the existence of privately held stockpiles across the African continent and Southeast and East Asia, where investors are hedging a continually rising retail price. And finally, um, on the consumption side, ivory is, um, a, is a pretty unique retail item, right? Um, with a consumer base all over the world. Um, 
with a variety of markets. Um, and as you can see from aggregating a series of ivory retail market studies from scholars like Esmond Martin, Lucy Vine, Fitz and Nijman, um, Daniel Stiles, across, and along with countless interviews with people on the ground across the African bush, um, you'll see a vast differential of retail prices. For example, the price that you'll see in an African bush market for a small carved ivory item, such as a bangle or a necklace, in a market like Ndele in the Central African Republic, um, is only a sliver of the price that you may find in an African urban center like Kisangani in the DRC, which again is an even smaller sli sliver of the final retail price that you'll see in an Asian consumer destination such as Beijing, where auction houses last year Witness prices skyrocket to $2,100 per kilo. And what you're also seeing is a trade that's characterized by value of these ivory products being extracted and also accrued by and large by consumers that exist thousands of miles outside of the African continent, largely at the expense of those local populations living in close proximity to elephant ranges. And, you know, Gretchen's work of course, highlight or brings this point home. But wildlife crime does often converge with other forms of conflict and illicit activity. And I think moving forward, I think we both would like to bring the point home that you know, wildlife trafficking and wildlife crime really does not exist in isolation as a purely conservation issue anymore. Um, I'd love to talk about more specific details of these instances um, offline or maybe in the Q&A. From our past research, we have found evidence to suggest that Sudanese-linked militias um, are involved in the ambush of not only park rangers, but also mass poaching incidents of elephants. We've uncovered evidence suggesting that South Sudanese police forces are crossing transnational borders into places like the DRC and Garamba National Park to also procure ivory from endangered elephant populations. Um, we've read accounts of Congolese army commanders um, providing weapons to rebel groups in exchange for ivory and gold. We've worked alongside Gretchen's firm, building out allegations linking illicit timber operations with bushmeat poaching in Central and West Africa, along with uncovering the nexus between ivory and copper smuggling in Tanzania and diamond and ivory smuggling in Botswana. Now, apart from the fact that wildlife crime may exist and may converge with a series of illicit economies, when ivory flows out of the African continent, it by and large obfuscates itself within channels of licit maritime commerce and finance. So our global ivory seizure database, which has logged approximately 800 seizures, um, unique ivory seizure instances since 2009, suggests that by and large the global ivory trade nestles itself in licit maritime shipping, shipping lanes. So we estimate that annually the vast majority of the global ivory trade flows in as few as 100 to 250 containers per year along a mere handful of key choke point container ports along the sub sub-Saharan African seaboard, Southeast and East Asia, along shipping lanes managed by a mere 10 to 15 companies. And as we've seen, wildlife traffickers actually use a very, a wide variety of means of physical obfuscation to actually, uh, to, to cover their operations, um, to transport 500 kilos or several tons of this contraband across geographic boundaries, across these illicit supply chains. So we've seen ivory covered in shea butter, videography equipment, um, charcoal, peanuts, um, and even containers themselves physically altered to hide this contraband. Now, if you will indulge me, let me provide a more specific example of a network of large-scale ivory seizures that are loosely linked through a single logistics and transport network and also to provide you guys a bit of insight into how we approach this issue as an issue of transnational organized crime. So let's start off with April 25th, 2015. Port officials at Lam Chibang Port in Thailand, which is a port right outside of Bangkok, seized 3.1 tons approximately of ivory products, obfuscated in tea leaves originated from Mombasa, destined for a company in Vietnam. Now, when this ivory shipment was about to be transported from Mombasa, the consignee or the receiver of the shipment was actually sh changed multiple times, originally from a Dubai-based trading firm to a Laotian-based company to, again, a Vietnamese-based, a Vietnam-based firm. Now, digging into our data sets using a variety of company rec using a variety of public records such as company registers, trade documentation, customs reporting, and also local media insight, along with, I guess, you know, eyes on the ground. 
we actually were able to find that the vehicles that are used to transport this ivory to the port of Mombasa, the container freight station in Mombasa, along with the exporters, all match those logistic profiles of a seizure of 3.7 tons across two containers seized in Singapore a mere weeks later on May 16th this year. Now this same exporter probably at least shipped probably six containers in the past calendar year. The three containers that have been seized at this point all contained multiple tons of ivory per container. So there is a likelihood that what, if you want to estimate probably three tons per container being, un being unseized, we're looking at nine to 10 tons of ivory products completely making its way through global shipping lanes undetected. Now digging through our past data sets, we've also noticed that other vehicles and other transport mechanisms also match those that have facilitated the shipments of at least three large-scale ivory seizures from 2015, seized in very, at very distinct points of the ivory supply chain in places like Mombasa, Singapore, and Hong Kong. And it turns out that the consigner of the specific Hong Kong seizure that's referenced here of 1.3 tons also had previously been arrested and subsequently acquitted for their role in shipping in attempting to ship illicit copper products from Zambia to Tanzania in 2011. Now, right here, we're looking at a network that probably trafficked over 14 tons of ivory products from the single logistic and transport infrastructure. If we want to assume an average tusk weight of 3.7 tons, um, along with if we want to assume that this quantity seized here represents approximately 10% of the total contraband being trafficked, as in you know, this 10% seizure rate being accepted by a variety of Western law enforcement officials, we're looking at elephant products coming from approximately 18 to 19,000 elephants. If we want to assume further that the three containers that were unseized also contain similar quantities of ivory, then we're looking at up to 35,000 elephants killed and whose, uh, whose ivory products being transported in the course of two years. Now, 35,000 is the majority of remaining pop, um, elephant populations in you know, key elephant corridors such as Mozambique. Now, scaling back a bit, looking at the 14 tons and assuming a retail value of approximately 14 USD per kilo, taking the mean of several of the most recent mainland Chinese retail studies along with Hong Kong retail market studies and Vietnam market surveys, you know, this contraband could be worth up to $20 million. Now, I presented this network briefly in July, but since then, some interesting developments have taken place. Remember this Vietnamese-based consignee that had been the final recipient of the seizure that happened in Thailand in April 25th? Well, just this path, past month in August, after tracing the beneficial ownership of this company, um, in August 13th, approximately 600 kilos of ivory were seized, along with 142 kilos of rhino horn originating from Mozambique were seized in the port of Da Nang, Vietnam, also consigned to the same firm. Now, although the Vietnamese business register is incredibly easy to navigate and is incredibly comprehensive and easy to digest in terms of extracting information on you know, directors and ownership of the company, this identifying information was actually very scarce. And it turns out several of these companies labeled here were actually established probably in March or April of this year now this leads, us to this leads us to assume potentially the use of shell or anonymous companies or establishing these commercial entities for the sole purpose of receiving these shipments. Days later after this ivory rhino horn shipment was seized in Da Nang, another 2.3 tons of ivory obfuscated in timber was also seized in the port of Da Nang, not originating from Mozambique, but this time originating from Lagos, Nigeria. Um, and then days later, a five-ton wildlife product shipment was seized, again, in the port of Da Nang, consigned to a company, according to Vietnamese customs, of having, I guess, a variety of business relationships with this original Vietnamese-based consignee. Now, this five-ton wildlife product shipment contained approximately one ton of ivory products and four tons of pangolin, originating from Malaysia, shipped to Vietnam. Now, stepping back a bit, what can we do moving forward? Um, you know, what can we do as Westerners or as Americans? How can we approach, how can we pursue action against this wildlife trade that largely flows along a Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia supply chain? Well, we have found that wildlife traffickers often maintain multiple bank accounts um, across disparate jurisdictions. And what we're looking at here is a sales contract from 
a Laotian-based trading firm trafficking hundreds of thousands of protected species to another trade-based firm or trading firm in Vietnam. Now, the Laotian-based firm is owned by a Vixe Keo Savong, a Lao-based wildlife trafficker who actually has a $1 million reward um, from the State Department for, quote, I believe, any information leading to the dismantling of his network. Now, Keo Savong, like this Vietnamese firm, may have a global network of facilitators and also wildlife trafficking counterparts. Um, if we want to look at this issue of wildlife crime as purely a conservation issue, what's most compelling about this contract is the sheer quantity of animals that are being trafficked, right? But for our interest here, that's not really the most compelling information, right? The most compelling information is this section here in the sales contract that states bank account information. So there's a number provided for an account at the Lao Development Bank of Paxson branch. Surface level reading of this may suggest that, all right, it's just the nearest local bank nearby. However, this bank itself has approximately a dozen foreign correspondent banking networks, five of which are US-based institutions. And if we want to, now, and if we assume that the majority of transnational financial flows, especially from Africa and Asia, are denominated in US dollars, there is a high likelihood that this transaction, that this capital did clear through a US financial or a Western financial system giving that jurisdiction a clear mandate to investigate these financial transactions further. And it's this, these financial flows, and investigating into these financial flows even further, that may yield a grander impact on diminishing the capacity of these key facilitators to continuing the trade. Because figures like Keo Savong, figures like this Vietnamese trading firm, they may be operating several, if not dozens, of, di of ostensibly disparate supply chains. And if we focus tackling the financial angle, then we can severely diminish their capacity to continue this trade and really make a dent, an actionable dent in the state of wildlife crime today. So I know I went a little over, over time, but thank you guys very much for indulging me, and I look forward to your questions. All right, Gretchen. Good morning. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, say many of the same things that Jackson just said in his excellent presentation. Um, my objective when I uh, became involved in um, uh, tracking wildlife crime was to follow the money uh, and to and investigate the logistical and financial operations uh, that were underpinning the major networks that are moving um, uh, wildlife. Predominantly, we're focused on uh, elephants and rhinos being uh, poached in Africa and trafficked to Asian consumer markets. Now, um, I want to just start by asking a hypothetical question. Why are traffickers smuggling wildlife? And the answer, of course, is to make money, yet this very simple point seems to be lost on somewhere in the range of 95% of the conservation community we found. A huge amount of attention is being focused on putting up fences around uh, national parks and private reserves, uh, <coughs> putting more park rangers out to protect wild animals across vast areas of wild space. And when we start uh, of, of wild territory, um, and very, there, there, there are virtually no groups almost besides uh, C4ADS and, and, and our team that are actually trying to follow the money and understand logistically how uh, these trafficking operations are set up. And the reason that this is important, there's a number of reasons why, why it's important. As Jackson just said, it's an area where the U.S. and the U.K., whose currencies dominate global trade, can really start to impact this problem, I believe. Um, but it's also um, important because there are so many, f so ma much fewer actors at this level. Um, when we started looking in, we had a project last year uh, that got off the ground twice and then twice got uh, got. Uh, 86th by the South African government. We were going to be working with the South African government uh, to help follow the money around rhino horn trafficking. Twice at the very last minute, our project was canceled uh, when some uneasy politicians in the um, ANC government that currently is in power in South Africa decided they didn't want American financial investigators looking into the problem as closely as we were planning to. 
Uh, so our project got canceled not once but twice. I still have the piece of paper, if anybody wants to see it, mandating me to work with South Africa's Financial Intelligence Center on rhino horn trafficking, but it's not even worth the paper that it's printed on. Um, so we've, had, we've actually had quite a lot of challenges trying to get governments in Africa and Asia to open up uh, their financial records to us and, help, and let us help them look for what's going on. Uh, but we've nonetheless, uh, working in open source and working very closely with Jackson's team at C4ADS, um, found some quite interesting information. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the links that we've put together. But, but it's really important to look at the financial flows around wildlife trafficking if we intend to um, save these animals. Seizing ivory, um, shipments of ivory, uh, is something that happens after the animals are already dead. One of the things that we have learned over and over again uh, in, in virtually all the countries that we have uh, uh, done research on this issue in is that poachers can generally not finance poaching by themselves. Uh, just as an example, the bullets that you use to um, hunt great game, like elephants and rhinos, cost as much as $20 to $30 per bullet. Your average post poacher, and if you re recall back to um, Jackson's donut that he presented in the last uh, in the last presentation, the average poacher is paid a pittance. They can't afford to buy. They can't afford to fill the tanks of cars. They can't afford to buy cars to actually drive out to the parks. Uh, where they're poaching. So it has to be financed by somebody. And we believe that if we can help cut the financing, the poaching will stop. Um, second of all, um, we, are, we are finding that traffickers are using, the wildlife traffickers are move, using trade-based money laundering. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to my friends Rob Sabirsky and John Kassara in the corner here because um, we, we are all trying to help uh, people who want to understand how transnational organized crime works in the world, you must understand the extent to which value is moved through the global transport system in the form of commodities. So um, we, will, we will regularly encounter traffickers who are in South Africa or Mombasa or Dar es Salaam or Zanzibar who are moving, who are also working as used car traders, who also have import-export firms moving agricultural products, moving used clothing. They're running hotels, casinos, cash-based businesses that they can use to launder their proceeds. Um, and also, uh, and sometimes those import-export firms are actually used to move the illicit commodities. But as often as not, uh, it is a, they operate these firms as a way to bring things of value back and those are their profits. Uh, and there's very little understanding of how those systems work. And we believe we can help African governments and Asian governments understand better how those systems work. Um, third of all, uh, another important thing that we're learning is that the traffickers engaging in wildlife crime are not just moving wildlife. Uh, in fact, most of them, what we're finding, are predominantly narcotics traffickers. In some places like South Africa and Mozambique, we're seeing a huge convergence with human trafficking. To give you an, a really evil, an example of a really evil case of trade-based money laundering, we uh, here have reports of um, women being trafficked into Africa from Asia and rhino horn moving from Africa to, uh, to Asia. So uh, Asian women being brought as uh, sex workers and the value that is put on them is sent in rhino horn out to Asia. So no money actually changed hands. Um, and I can also say uh, the other broad conclusion we can make from the, from the work we've done so far is that, is that corruption uh, is probably the elephant's biggest threat in Africa. We have, um, we're looking at this problem in uh, a number of different countries. Uh, in some places, uh, and, and, and everywhere we're looking, uh, corruption is the single most important enabling factor uh, for getting ivory, for getting elephants or rhinos or other animals killed, and getting the uh, wildlife parts out of the country, um, it might, this might be the uh, park rangers who get paid off to help poachers identify where the animals are. It might be customs officers taking a payment to let a um, uh, to let a container go through. And in some places that we're working or we're we're uh, investigating, the uh, the state itself is the primary criminal actor in moving wildlife. Um, and they're not just moving wildlife. Uh, we, we, the convergence with other, uh, with other illicit products, in particular narcotics, but also weapons, uh, is, is uh, profound. Um, I want to go through, I don't have much time, so I want to go through um, some of the incredible convergence that we have found as we've looked, at our, at the, as we've looked into the networks across the continent. 
We have, uh, we're looking at East Asian traffickers, both Vietnamese and Chinese, uh, operating in South Africa, um, uh, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, and Kenya. These networks have been found to be linked through multiple, through seizure records, uh, through phone records, through uh, uh, police reports that we've had a chance to look at. We've got a drug kingpin in Mozambique that we're looking at who seems to be moving tremendous amounts of rhino horn and ivory in addition to uh, multi-ton consignments of narcotics. We're looking at a trafficker in um, Tanzania who's linked to money laundering, uranium smuggling, and drug trafficking. We're looking at a uh, 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 jailed kingpin for ivory uh, in um, Kenya who is also wanted uh, by narcotics agents. He was actually found uh, hiding out. When he was arrested, he was found in the home of uh, drug traffickers who were arrested in December by the Drug Enforcement Administration. Uh, the team, that logistics team that led, uh, that drove the containers of ivory that Jackson was talking about that were later seized in Thailand and Singapore, uh, that drove the containers of ivory uh, out of the packing center and then t diverted them uh, and packed them full of ivory. Um, uh, that team uh, is also connected to those drug traffickers and the ivory trafficker in Mombasa. Uh, we've also got trafficking networks um, out of Uganda that play a critical role in moving drugs, guns, and ivory through the center of the continent, of, often moving drugs, or sorry, drugs and uh, ivory that is coming out of Central Asia, sorry, Central Africa, the CAR, Gabon, and um, the Republic of Congo uh, that are moving uh, through these very sophisticated logistical operations in Uganda. We're looking at uh, Chinese road building and timber firms that are moving ivory under the cover of their um, uh, regular commercial operations that are operating across Central Africa and in East Africa. We've uh, had great collaboration again on, this pro on that research with C4ADS because they have many um, excellent Chinese speakers, including our two attendees here today. Uh, when we originally started looking at some of these Chinese timber firms, they appeared to be 40 or 50 different companies. When, we start, when they started doing the research into the ownership structure back in Hong Kong and Macau, they found that it was actually just three, uh, three companies. It wasn't, wasn't 45 companies, it was just three of them. They were owned by the same three sets of, in, of people. Um, so what looked like many, many different operations were actually a much larger uh, criminal enterprise out of China. Uh, we're also, whoops, that all moved forward a lot faster than it was supposed to. Uh, we're also looking um, at uh, Lebanese and Nigerian traffickers moving uh, goods by sea up the uh, western coast of Africa. They appear to be tra uh, linked to uh, drug trafficking networks moving um, cocaine, heroin, uh, and weapons, as well as probably people, although we, based on earlier information, we believe they're also involved in uh, people trafficking. And the other thing that's interesting is that uh, in police reports have, have shown us that, um, that seizures that have been made on both the east and western sides of the uh, African con uh, continent have selectors in common, so phone numbers, addresses. And so we believe that some of the networks that are moving these multi-ton consignments of, ivories, uh, of ivory off the African continent are actually operating on both sides of the continent. Now, I teach about convergence, and I teach about how, um, uh, how focused or, or how small these networks are at the transnational level, but even I am surprised um, at the amount of connectivity we're seeing among all of these networks uh, that are operating all over the African continent. I really believe that if um, U.S. law enforcement and the U.S. intelligence community were to support an effort to go after these networks in a comprehensive way, we would not only reduce a lot of problems and threats emanating from the African continent, uh, but it would actually be a fairly manageable number of targets to go after in a, well, in a properly resourced um, operation. Um, I think I'm out of time. I'm just going to really go through uh, very – oops, this is really moving quickly all of a sudden. Um, we also have looked into uh, seizure, seizure records uh, and the connectivity between them. Again, we were surprised by the extent to which uh, big multiple seizures from multiple countries in Africa had important linkages. There was a seizure that took place in November 2013 in Dar es Salaam. Data found there or evidence found there led authorities 11 days later to make a subsequent seizure in Zanzibar. Um, that led them to a network that operates out of 
now it doesn't want to go at all. Oh, um, that led them to make a seizure uh, later, uh, or um, that connected them to an earlier seizure that had been made in uh, Malawi in 2013. Um, and there are the, whoops, well, I'm just going to make the point that <laughs> there are also uh, multiple connections between some of these major seizures that were made uh, this year. I also believe if we were to take the records from all of those seizures, and this is an analytic project that has never been comprehensively done, uh, C4ADS and us rely on the scraps that we can get African and Asian law enforcement to pass us or what has been put out in the news. Um, we believe that if this could be done at a law enforcement sensitive level, working with our partners in those countries, um, and we could overlay that data with uh, data around weapons and narcotic seizures that have been made, uh, that we will start to really be able to hone in on these networks. And on that, I will finish. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, you managed to lay it out in a slightly overwhelming um, way in that, you know, the problem is huge, but also able to sort of narrow it down so that if we wanted to move forward, I think you gave some practical um, solutions. So I thank you for that. So we only have about five minutes. I know I have a question. Wanted to see if anybody in the audience did as well. Um, okay, maybe Porter, I'll just ask you to um, ask your question, and then the <coughs> gentleman behind you, I'll ask mine, and then you guys will have the last couple minutes to wrap up. Thank you so much for your presentations. I, I learned a lot. Um, one question I have, just a real quick one. Um, do you have local partners that you're working with, or is this sort of a, a, a travel in, get information, head back here? And then the gentleman behind you. We, we definitely both, both have local partners that we rely on completely. Uh, it, um, it, it takes a network to, to do something like this, and we have um, partners both in Asia and in Africa uh, and other parts of the world that we work with very closely, I mean, on a daily basis. And thank God for Skype and WhatsApp. We, can, we are in touch very regularly with our partners around the world. Right. I mean, we do our best also to rely as much as possible on official documentation and kind of hold ourselves to you know, the highest evidentiary standards possible before making any claims. Um, but of course, in you know, the jurisdictions that we're working with, not all of those records are digitized or available to us in Washington. So I mean, we definitely rely on a variety of local, a slew of local partners, not just in, in the African continent, but in Southeast and East Asia as well. And Dave, our other wildlife crime analyst who's here, um, we're coordinating with approximately 80 NGOs worldwide, um, but also you know, simply providing them analytical support as well. So. Gretchen Jackson, in your efforts to follow the money and value trails, have you uncovered any links to Chinese underground financial systems, uh, networks, such Fiching, flying money systems? Um, I've seen, um, I, I've heard reports in um, uh, Vietnam of consumers buying um, rhino horn using flying money to, or they're asked to make a payment to order the rhino horn through, through a hawala-like or flying mm -hmm. money-like system. Um, and we see a lot of uh, informal systems being used to transfer value and to, and to pay people, whether it's something like in Pesa in Tanzania or Kenya, to, um, uh, to systems where people are paid, in, in, as, as uh, Jackson said, in some sort of bush currency. So they're paid in some commodity that provides them value. Um, so we, we do see that. I would say we are uh, really not anywhere nearly as far along as we would like to be in terms of comprehensively following the money. As I said, we had a deal earlier this year to be working with South Africa's Financial Intelligence Center. We've been trying to negotiate agreements with other African governments. Uh, but we, you can't look at the money, as you well know. You can't follow the money unless you're working with the government. And if you do, you can, I've had a number of times had people in Africa offer to sell me bank records, but if we go and buy them, then it doesn't become admissible. It, it would ruin somebody's case. So we have, we, we have been focusing our energy on trying to get a partnership with a, with a government so we can start helping them to do, and, and we have a background, we are experienced to doing this. We uh, are cleared to do it. We, so it's just finding that partnership and somebody who actually cares to, to uh, uh, to pull the trigger and let us let us go to work. Maybe just a follow up on that. This, I asked you this yesterday in our prep call. Mm -hmm. What what do you do when the government is 
complicit? You know, how do you approach it if you're operating in a country and you know it's clear that the that the illicit uh, action goes all the way up to the top? I mean, what then? Is that when you have to rely on the international actors? Uh, I personally think that at this point, the, the big traffickers in Africa um, will need to be um, pursued or targeted in a transnational operation, probably led by the United States and the, and the British governments. Uh, I don't believe there's a single African government with either the judicial or prosecutorial capacity to, to take on any of these networks, and we've what few efforts we've seen to go after the high-level traffickers have failed, and, and mainly because there isn't the political will. Um, so I do think the U.S. Uh, is going to have to play a larger role if, if this government is serious about trying to save animals, or even if they're not. These traffickers are not only moving wildlife. They ought to be taken out for the range of crimes that they're committing. Um, but, but we're having... Um, but I don't think at this point it will be led by, th this is a problem that will be handled by African states on their own. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for that, but, but largely it's a, it's a question of uh, lack of political will. And in many cases um, where we're looking, the state is the primary criminal actor. Mm -hmm. And so you're certainly not going to, but, but even, you know, I learned to do this stuff working in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So I like to tell people that I, you know, learned about corruption right in the belly of the beast. And it, it um, even in incredibly corrupt environments, you can find good people trying to do the right thing. And we've been able to find really amazing people to work with in virtually every country we've been in. So I, I don't have any doubt that this can, this can be done. Uh, it's just a question of some uh, agency and government taking the lead on it. And right. we don't have that yet. We don't have that happening. Right. And Sarah, if I may jump in, um, I think your question sort of compels or should compel everyone to think a lot more creatively about simply just the functional steps required to facilitate these kinds of illicit wildlife transactions, right? Um, so rather, instead of you know, expending energies on you know, targeting someone that may, on the surface level, seem untouchable, um, what about you know, the logistic capacity? What about their access simply at these container choke points, right? Correct. Both the Kenyan Revenue Authority, along with the slew of Tanzanian, Rev Tanzanian maritime agencies, all publish a list of both licensed and suspended freight forwarders, clearing agents, and exporters at major seaports like Dar es Salaam, Mombasa, and Zanzibar. And all of those are available in the open source. And so if we're seeing one or two freight forwarders, or even a private container freight station, for example, in the port of Mombasa, constantly being used simply for their access, um, you know, that could be another way to approach simply just extracting the physical capacity to actually transport this contraband. But I think we would have to get the financial community involved as well if we're going to go that routing. Um, we have seen over and over that the traffickers in Africa have, the trafficking networks in Africa have been incredibly responsive and adaptive to law enforcement intervention or perceived law enforcement intervention. Uh, and so that we have watched them shift the activities mm -hmm. from Dar es Salaam to Zanzibar to Malawi. Uh, and uh, we're probably going to see a shift s again soon because of all the activity that's been taking place in Mombasa. Um, and I believe that they have not been impacted because nobody's gone after their money. The financing has remained in place, and therefore they've just shifted their physical operations. So last question, and I know that we, we have a couple more for the audience, but if you'll indulge me. the. Um, the U.S. government, both administration and Congress, has attempted to take some policy measures, and I'm wondering if, if you all can talk about that. I was at the Africa Brain Trust on Friday, and Susan Rice mentioned why I like trafficking in the context of you know the U.S. working with Africa on corruption, so it was kind of under that subheading as it was when President Obama made his mm -hmm. speech in Addis. Obviously, we have the, the National Strategy for Combating Wildlife Trafficking, the Global Anti-Poaching Act from the U.S. Congress. You know, Gretchen, especially in light of what you mentioned where you know, 95% of the community, the conservation community at least necessarily, doesn't get it. it. How do you see these policy prescriptions fitting in or not? And then Jackson, if you have any thoughts. I think there's a number of ways in which the U.S. Mm -hmm. government ought to look at this problem differently. Um, first of all, it's not a conservation problem. It's an organized crime problem. And therefore, um, when the U.S. Congress um, 
designates money for this issue, it should go to organizations that fight crime and not organizations that uh, 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 agencies within the government that do conservation. Uh, I'm not saying there isn't a, a big job for um, uh, for conservation agencies also and conservation uh, groups uh, globally, but there really needs to be more focus and more funding uh, for the people who fight organized crime uh, and, and who fight money laundering. Uh, and, and that, I believe, has been under-resourced uh, and an un unfocused aspect of this problem. Um, I also think that um, uh, we have to stop stovepiping these issues. Um, f between drugs, human trafficking, wildlife trafficking, gun smuggling, uh, because th the traffickers are all working together. So when we come to, say, the Drug Enforcement Administration and bring a pat packet of evidence about a trafficker and they say, well, we can't work with you because our we're a one mission agency that does drugs. And we say, well, we don't care. We're bringing you information about a drug trafficker. Th that makes my head explode mm -hmm. every time that happens. We need our agencies. Uh, to start um, looking at crime and crime networks uh, and not, you, you never see the drug traffickers say, I'm not letting that guy carry my heroin, he's a terrorist, mm -hmm. right? And yet, we'll, we have agencies in our government who say, well, we handle terrorism, not narcotics, not organized crime. It's impossible to divide these networks any longer. Mm. They are engaged in a multitude of, of activities and our uh, crime fighting agencies have to be as flexible and adaptive and multifaceted as their enemies are, or Very we powerful. will fail. Powerful point. Jackson, you get the last word. No, of course. I mean, so I couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, I think the most recent policy prescriptions um, are an incredibly appropriate invitation to invite um, stakeholders that may not have realized that they have a tangible stake in wildlife crime and looking at it as an issue of transnational organized crime. Um, however, I think, you know, you inviting so many new or ostensibly new stakeholders to the table unfortunately may also invite a whole new slew of bureaucratic processes and a whole <laughs> lot of paperwork. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in terms of each organization's specific mandate and each organization's capacity, I think as long as those channels of communication are kept open, only then will we really see some pretty rapid and tangible results. Um, other than that, unfortunately, I feel like we may risk being buried at lo buried under a lot of paperwork. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'm sorry we didn't get to your questions. Maybe y'all can have a coffee afterwards. Um, but please join me in thanking uh, Jackson and Gretchen for a great panel. Thank you. Well, thanks very much to our panelists, Gretchen and Jackson, and to Sarah for uh, her uh, very successful moderating of that panel. What a fascinating discussion. Uh, the detail is incredible. Uh, great to hear from Jackson um, how beneficial ownership can be used uh, and the way it's used. Once you know the owners of companies, you can actually track what they're doing. Uh, Gretchen's comment about how whether some of these uh, traffickers are moving uh, uh, guns or um, uh, wildlife or, or other uh, illicit uh, commodities. Uh, reminds me of a conversation I had with a U.S. Army officer about 10 years ago at the Central Command who was tracking uh, gun running in Afghanistan. And when I asked him how they found out where they're running the guns, he said, oh, it's where they're running the drugs. I said, so you're seeing both at the same time? And he said, yes. And I said, so you're, you're collecting both at the same time? He said, no, 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 drugs is DEA. We don't do that. So it's, it, it goes right to what uh, Gretchen was saying. It's going to be looked at a holistic, in a holistic way, I think, before we're going to have any major impact on it. 